Okay. Let's be different. Let's let's switch to a blue today. Okay. So now we're going to talk about switching, loading, and others. <clears throat> so here we have a range of applications. You're going to hear a whole bunch of them here. So this is sort of a very broad type of category. It includes use of switches. And this gets into not only where do you have the authority to go to the track and others, the dispatcher controls the switches, but also where the train crew. Remember, you can have switches um, where they're, they're only controlled by the dispatcher and the, and the train crew has no physical way of changing a switch. And you can have manual switches where the train crew can physically get out and switch the sw and, and physically move the switch from one position to another and physically move it out. Now, obviously, the second one has a greater potential for error. Okay. You have um, issues relating to uh, flagging signals. Uh, this is where you get a lot into the yard type of accidents, which are very primal. General switching rules is where, can, where and when do you have the right to switch, et cetera. Um, train handling and train makeup falls into this category. Speed, of course, falls into this category. Use of brakes falls into this category. And there's some others which we'll show you. I'm going to show you some examples here that, 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 that show you the type of range of operations. Some of them which are, are, are you know, the potential are quite, so quite significant. Okay. So if we look at, uh, you know, wh where do we see a lot of the European uh, type of tra uh, train operations accidents? So the DNV are European accidents, as opposed to American or Russian, which I show here. So unfavorable train composition, just putting wagons in the wrong place or <clears throat> just um, distributing the wagons through the, through the train improperly is, is uh, improper train composition, which is different than improperly loading the individual wagons. So you can see here, uh, improperly loading of wagons or insufficient fastening of load uh, are, 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 are real uh, issues in the, uh, in the European world. Um, brakes not properly checked or tested. Um, <clears throat> points switch to a new position while the points occupied by the train. Um, speed pass, the uh, signal pass, that danger, which we talked about. Um, those are those are common that we see in the in the, in the, in the European world. DNV um, is European or it's yes, DNV is European. DNV and DNV are DNV is a study. I think I gave you the reference beginning of last lecture, uh, last week's lecture. Um, yeah, yeah, that's I, right. Um, but DNV is a study that was based on the Euro, on the main European railroads. If we look among the the different the, the different uh, European railroads individually, you'll see that the British and I've mentioned this before they really like to talk about human factors. Uh, the French have French have a large a very large category of wagons improperly row loaded here, which uh, uh, which is an interesting situation here. Um, the Austrians have. Uh, uh, driver mishaps, poor driver control, et cetera. And improperly lined switches are a major problem. Uh, and positive train control helps in those territories where it's implemented. Now, the, the issue in most of the world is that we don't implement positive train control or ETCS, European Train Control Systems, everywhere because it's simply um, when you're dealing with low density lines there's a question of whether the cost justifies the uh, is justified by the volume of traffic and that's even true in the in Europe as well so you, you know for instance you go to you go to England 
Um, you know, you you know, certainly there's no dispute on the main tracks you put in all the train control systems you want. But when we get into secondary tracks and yard tracks and sidings and industrial sidings, you know, industrial sidings are a classic example. What's an industrial siding? An industrial siding is a railway siding in a, in a, in a company, in an industry uh, where you're marshalling your, your wagons before the railroad comes and picks it up. So um, in Israel, for example, I don't know if anybody has ever been down to Nahal Tzin, down in the Negev. Uh, I, I spent a bunch of time down there uh, a number of years ago. Um, that's, where, that's where all the potash wagons are, are, are loaded uh, and, then, and then, then, then moved on for shipment. A lot of them going up to, to, Haifa, to Haifa for export. Um, and um, uh, the question becomes, do we, you know, you're only dealing with industrial commodities. There's no people, there's no passengers down there. Uh, it's a busy, you know, it's a relatively busy railroad, but, but there are no people there. What kind of technology do you do there? A lot of the switches in the industrial side, in fact, virtually all switches in industrial track are hand thrown because you have to have the ability for people who are moving wagons from one train to a local locate another, where we the term is switching wagons, um, you have to be able to 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 move a to move your switches uh, by the train crews by the switch crews, so that you can't rely on the dispatcher doing it all. So you so you so the situation that I showed you before with the siding collision, that was actually a manually thrown switch because it was an industrial siding. Okay, so as I said, if 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 you, if, if, we, if it's a busy system, if it's a place where we have a lot of uh, we, we have passenger and freight operations or passenger operations, more than likely we're going to use system. We're going to use uh, uh, some sort of train control signaling system to tell what's going on. Okay, so again, where are the cracks? Here's, a, here's an Amtrak accident. This is a US accident, uh, 2018. So this was after, so positive train control really has been in place already in this particular technology. So a passenger train uh, collided with a stationary freight train in a, in a, in a siding in, in South Carolina in the, down in the Southern part of the United States. It was a net messy accident. Two Amtrak crew members were killed, 116 injuries. Um, uh, the lead engine and several cars derailed. The, the CSX train was severely damaged. It was a messy accident, as you can see over here. Um, the, the, the CSX train was already parked in the siding. This was actually very similar to my very first video that I showed you. Uh, no, the, no, the, 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 sorry, the first of the two videos I showed you right before break, where the, where the train was parked in the siding, the switch was what was switch it was it, it was set over and went over. So how come if we have positive train control, how what happens? Um, the CSX train was stationary and was was where it belonged to be. The Amtrak train was switched onto the wrong track. What happened? The switch was incorrectly lined and locked for the siding instead of the main track. Why didn't the signaling system uh, we have detect it? The signaling system in the area was not opera, was not working due to a signal suspension for signal maintenance purposes. They were actually upgrading the software. There was a software upgrade going on. They it was it was it was taking a number of hours. They couldn't. They, they couldn't stop every bit of train operation. It's just, you just, it's really hard to shut down a railroad completely, uh, you know, because, you, because, you do, because you're doing some, some activity. You usually try to figure out a way to work around it. So the, uh, the system was suspended and the trains were being dispatched manually by, by the CSX dispatcher. The, tr the first train crew, the crane that was in the siding, they, because that switch was a manual switch, they had lined and locked off the switch from the mainline track. 
Um, and so the uh, the switch could, the, 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 the switch was set was set uh, towards the siding, and the signaling system was not aware that happened. And so the dispatcher ended up sending the Amtrak train down the down to a track where there was a, there was a train already sitting there. Positive train control would have worked fine had the signal system been up in full operation. But in this particular case, there was a upgrade in signal. And we've seen this. This is not just, as I, as I mentioned earlier before the break, this is not just uh, something we see in the, with the crazy Americans, but the, we, we, we've seen the exact same thing with the very meticulous Germans. Uh, the Germans have had a number of accidents exactly similar to this one, where the signaling system was not working properly, was under, was under maintenance, and they had turned the operations over to a dispatcher and the dispatcher. And in fact, one of the problems here, and this goes back to the point we just made, one of the problems here is, are we in a situation where the dispatchers are so used to now relying on the technology that if the technology is not present, they don't know what to do. So going back to the question of how do we maintain safety, Yes, the technology is wonderful, and that's great 99.9% .9 of the time. But we know from experience that accidents happen 90, you know, it's the 0.0001% event. That's where the, was where the accidents happened. We have, everything is safe. Railway, railway in general is safe to 99.99%. It's the 0.01% to the 0.0001% to the 0.0001%. That's the accident. Okay. This is the, 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 this is this is this is a collision between a uh, a freight train and as and some stationary yard cards in non-signal territory. And I put it in there to make the point that there is a lot of on non-signal territory there. And so you have to you you don't so 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 th this is a yard where there's a lot of back and forth movement uh, in, in the track. And again, the yard switch was improperly lined. This is a manual switch. And you have them in Israel too, promise you. You have manual switches in Israel as well as in the US. And, if they, and the manual switch is left improperly lined. This is a, this is a straight tra train crew error. Poor, poor, poor training, poor follow up in the train crew. This is a passenger train. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time of that. There's some other interesting accidents I want to get to. So um, this is just another passenger train, a passenger train, freight train accident. Again, the train, the, the the train crew lined up the switches and forgot to reverse the and uh, forgot to move the switches back in place after they. Uh, after, after, the, after they finished moving their train. Ah, now let's get to some places where suddenly train up, where, where suddenly we're out of the PTC world now. Okay, so this is one of, the, I, I like talking about this now. Unfortunately, this is a unfortunately or not unfortunately, but this is a cold weather accident. So it's not something you're probably going to see in Israel. But I would, but the lesson is an important lesson, and I really want to make this lesson. So this is a runaway. So first of all, before I do anything else, let me give you a nice little video. I want to show you uh, a picture of a runaway, just so we can see that. Um, Let me just show you what I'm going to show you a video of a simple runaway because I don't have I don't have a video of a of a major runaway, but I just want to get you an idea of what we mean by a runaway. Okay, where am I? Why don't I see myself? Oh my. Okay, oh, let's redo that. Okay. This is a runaway. Single, a single wagon, 
And look at the amount of energy involved. Oh my goodness. Now, no train control system in the world will stop, a, will stop this kind of runaway because this is a plane wagon sitting somewhere. It, 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 while it has a brake system, it, uh, it, um, uh, it, it, it can't be applied. In fact, the fact that it's a runaway means that probably the air brake, the, the, air, the air exhaust is already exhausted. Um, it, it means that more than likely there's no air in the air reservoir on this car. And it's just uh, just going down on its own energy and its oh, own inertia. Okay. So now let's go back to this, which is a little bit more interesting of a runaway problem. Okay. So this happened in Northern Canada in January. So cold weather is clearly an issue here. Okay, so on January 18, 2012, and it doesn't make a difference whether there was positive train control or UTCS or whatever, none of that would have stopped this type of accident because when you have a bunch of wagons running away, there's no, no train control system in the world will We'll, we'll, we'll stop this one. Okay, so 13 loaded coal cars were basically ran uncontrolled uh, from a siding and collided with a stationary train. So a train was standing still. Uh, the train was at milepost 41.4.5. The, the run runaway cars left at 41.7. So that's roughly three miles, about five kilometers. So the runaway train ran five kilometers before it hit, before it hit uh, the stationary train. Uh, nine of the 13 cars derailed, plus the three loading, le leading locomotives from the stationary train derailed. Two crew members were injured, uh, or three crew members were injured, one, one seriously, and all sorts of damage, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, just some typical pictures. Okay. So this is a really interesting one. So I'm gonna spend a, a minute or two talking about this one. Okay, so what actually happened was these 13 cars had actually been removed from a train the night before and they were left on a siding. Now, what happened? Why were they left on this? Well, they were, why were they left uh, on, on, on the siding the night before? or the morning of actually. Okay, so that, that morning, so really about three in the morning, there was a coal train that, was, that, that had experienced a couple of emergency brake applications because the couplers were broken. The connectors between the wagons broke because they were going up a, a, a grade, uh, it was cold weather. Um, a lot of castings tend to lose strength in very cold weather. So there was some fracture problems. There was emergency braking. So the, the crew had basically had ended up between these two broken drawbars, had spent about five and three quarters of an hour just move, moving and setting out cars at between three and 5 a.m., working in the middle of Canada in January at, at 3 a.m. So look at the temperature there. So those of you who've, those of you who've never known minus 40 degrees C, let me just tell you it's cold. Things freeze and break and fracture. So um, uh, I will tell you that I have a lot of sympathy for any crew working in that, in that, in that temperature because I've been in that situation where we have had to work outdoors in minus 40 degrees C. Okay, so, so he had these 13 cars that he just had to set aside because there were some broken drawbars, there were some problems with the brake line, and he, so he, he put them on a siding away from everybody, from other traffic. 
but he wasn't aware. Again, remember, this is between three and four in the morning, pitch black, 40 degree below centigrade. He wasn't aware of the fact that it was a 1% grade. So that's a 10 mil grade, a 1% grade, one in 100, 10 in 1000 grade. And he actually thought the grade was level. So when he put the, when he secured the cars, he only applied one handbrake out of the 13 wagons, because quite honestly, it was 40 below. They were exhausted. They still had to continue their run. They still had to get to someplace before they ran out of, before their operable, their work time expired. So he only applied handbrakes. Remember the handbrakes? Handbrakes we've talked about before. Handbrakes are the emergency backup braking system when that you apply when you park a car, particularly when you park cars on grades, to make sure they don't move uh, because you can't rely on the air brake system. I'm going to have another even more classical accident later in another couple of minutes to talk about how critical handbrakes are. Okay. So as I said, this was going on between 3 and 5 a.m. It was minus 40 below. Uh, the crew had multiple breakdowns, was working for about five and a half, uh, almost six hours just uh, um, moving these cars around. Uh, the conductor, one of the train crew, really was experiencing performing impairments. Trust me, if you're working six hours and minus 40 below at 3 in the morning, you'd experience performance, performance impairment as well. You wouldn't be working quite well. So he basically was in a hurry to get out of there, get into a warm cab again, warm locomotive cab. So he set one handbrake. Um, they also thought that there was, there was some, there, there was, uh, um, you know, they, they, they had the air brakes. Uh, as well had been set because the, you know because the brake line was cut, the air brakes are set. The problem was that over time the air in in the brake reservoir bleeds off. Railroad, we talked about this uh, in a previous class. Railroad air brakes are not designed to be airtight. They can't be. They're designed to be constantly recharged by the locomotive. So the locomotive is constantly replenishing the air in, 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 the, in, the, in the reservoirs on each wagon in the train. Um, and so there, there's no need for to be airtight. So once you separate the wagons from the locomotive, then there's no recharging of the air. The air in the, in the, in the normal air brake reservoir bleeds off. And so the, those brakes become ineffective. And at that point in time, the only brake that works is the, is the handbrake. And in this particular case, we had one handbrake operating on 13 loaded tow cone cars. So you're looking at, this is, this is North America. So these are 130 ton uh, coal cars. So 13 coal cars uh, would be what? 1,300 uh, clo close. Close to 16 or 1700 tons, you know, the weight of a, of a normal uh, Israeli freight car uh, on a 1% grade, a 1 in 100 grade, with only one handbrake applied. That's not much holding it. So what happened is when the when the air in the res in the in the air brake reservoir ran down ran, ran out, the amber the hair the the one handbrake was not sufficient. Gravity. Basically, the one in 100. So you know, you're looking at uh, uh, you, 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 you're, you're looking at the uh, uh, normal force, the uh, they show me the tangential force associated with the 30, with the 16, 1700 tons of uh, of train, um, and so you're looking at uh, you know if it's if it's one in 100. You're looking at what 15 tons, 16 tons of force against one handbrake. Not it doesn't have the holding power to do that, and so uh, it will. Uh, the, the, the 13 cars ran away, ran down the hill, went down. What I say, three and five kilometers, three and a half miles, and uh, hit a park train. So that was one runaway train. Now let me give you sort of one of the classical runaway train accidents in world and in, in railroad history. 
um, certainly in modern railroad history. And that is the Lemagentic derailment uh, in the summer of 2013 in, uh, in Lemagentic, Canada. This is in Quebec, which is on the eastern part of Canada. Um, but this, 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 was, this, this, this was sort of a classical, what you can do, right? what you really can do with, uh, when, when you're dealing with a railroad. So this is summer. So it's not, we're not dealing with cold weather. So we, we, we are dealing with, with, you know, with the situation that you can see there. So to give you uh, an advantage, advantage in advance, um, this is downtown Lemagentic after the accident, as you can clearly see over here. This was, this part of town used to look like that. This was a, this is a downtown city. And you can see this looked like, it looks like it was subject to a major bombing run. Um, and it did, you know, 20, 26 odd tank cards all exploded downtown. Again, you can see a picture of what downtown, this is all downtown Magentic after the, uh, after the accident. You can see, you can see how well you can, if, if you think it looks like there was a big fire, there was a big fire. As you can see right over here, um, these, these, were, these were all petroleum tank cars. This was a whole train of petroleum tank cars. That's the plume of smoke associated with the uh, with this accident. Um, and as I said, this is relatively recent. This is 2013, so this was about eight years ago. Okay, so what happens? There was a there was a freight train with 72 tank cars filled with crude petroleum, petroleum, crude oil, crude petroleum, uh, very common uh, to ship petroleum by rail uh, in many parts of the world and definitely in North America. So this particular train had a weight of approximately 11,000 tons, which is a heavy but not out of line train. And it was parked. It was parked on a one percent grade. What happened? The train driver basically finished his hours of operation. A train driver is allowed to work eight hours in North America, and if he goes beyond eight hours, he has to stop, park the train, let a new driver take over. So he came to a station, um, a place called Nantes. where there was a main track and a siding and he parked the train and he was told to leave it on overnight. The train crew was going to come in the morning and take it for the next leg of the trip. So he parked the train and uh, end of a shift and basically went home or went to a motel or, uh, you know, he, I don't think he lived in Nantes. He probably just went to a motel. So he parked the train roughly uh, 1,685 feet above sea level. So that's what, that's roughly uh, 500 meters above sea level. And it was parked on a 1% grade. Again, 1% is one in 100 or 10 mils. Okay, so this was 11 p.m. June 15th. The engineer parked the train. He turned, he, it had a couple of locomotives on it. He turned off the trailing locomotives, but he left the lead locomotive running overnight so that it would have, so it would plenish the air brake system and the air brakes, which he engaged, would work properly. And because he left the engine on to engage the air brake system, he didn't put a lot of handbrakes on. In fact, the number of handbrakes he actually put on is in dispute. He, he claims that he put 11 handbrakes. 
out of the 70 odd cars, 72 cars, which is one in seven, um, the subsequent investigation suggested he may have only put one or two handbrakes on because he basically felt very comfortable. He left the engine on, the engine was, was, was replenishing. So we didn't, we didn't have the problem with the braking, with the air brake leakage we had with the previous situation because in the previous situation, there was no, there was no uh, compressor um, constantly replenishing the air supply in the reservoir. So you had to rely on the handbrakes. Here, the engineer was of the impression that the engine was operating, which he did, he left it on. The, the reservoirs and all 72 cars were being replenished by the compressor. And so the air brake system was working fine and there was no problem. So he thought everything was fine, no problem, we're doing, you know, we're, we're okay. Okay, he happened to have left the train on the main line because there was another train parked in the siding. And uh, given the fact that there wasn't that many, no, there were no more trains expected that night, the, operator, you know, the, 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 the operators, the, the, the dispatcher said that it was okay. Um, it was okay to leave it parked in the main line. The place where he fell off was according to rules, the sufficient number of handbrakes must be applied to prevent it from moving. Number of hand, sufficient number of handbrakes to be applied is the function of the grade. The steeper the grade, the more handbrakes applied. But in general, for a 1% grade, probably you should apply one out of four or one out of five handbrakes. Um, you know, so uh, they should have applied maybe uh, 14, 15 handbrakes. Um, you know, maybe 11 would have been enough, but one or two, nowhere near enough. Okay, so here it is, 11, 11.30 at night. Um, the train is parked on the main line, which is okay because there's nothing else expected. The, dry, the, the, the driver, the engineer has left, uh, there was, but he left the engine running. And all of a sudden at 11.30, uh, some of the local people in the town saw smoke coming out of the locomotive. So they called emergency, they called 911 or uh, whatever the emergency numbers are. Canada uses the same 911 system as America. So uh, apparently there was a lot, of, a lot of smoke and a lot of exhaust. So the fire department came. The fire department came and they saw that there was a ruptured fuel line on the locomotive. And so they turned the engine off before they tended to, before they put out the flames, which is probably not a bad idea. You know, last thing you want to do is have a working locomotive while you're working with a fire going. So they turned the engine off and uh, they put out the flames and they left. They found, they say, reported the fire, to, that, the, that the fire was under control and they, they left. And they did not turn the locomotive engine back on. Among other things, they're not railroad people. Why should they turn the locomotive engine on? They don't know what's going on. They don't know the situation. They're firefighters. So all of a sudden, we now have a 11,000 ton train sitting on a 1% grade, um, sitting... Uh, with, with one or two handbrakes applied, and the air uh, in the reservoir is rapidly leak, leak, leaking away uh, because there's no compressor to, to, to replenish them. So all of a sudden, so, you know, so a couple of, an hour later or so, um, some, some nearby residents said they sort of felt the train start to move. No lights, the engine was turned off, and the train started to move. And it was on a 1% grade. Um, as I said, the starting point was about 515 meter elevation. And it started, and it started traveling about 12 kilometers. So you can see, you can see here's the grade line, and here's the speed line. And of course, the further down it goes, the faster it goes. So at the end of about 12 kilometers, it's going about 120 kilometers per hour. Now, question to anybody, 
Would positive train control or ETCS have worked at this point in time? Because the engine was there. There was an engine. In fact, there were two engines. Would ETCS work and solve this problem? No, what? No, I can't hear you. Can you say that again? No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, you, you're coming in very, very, very loud. You, you know, I, I, you're breaking up. I just can't hear you. Somebody want to repeat what he said? So I'm asking the question again. Would, would, would positive train control or advanced train control or ETCS have, have, have stopped this train at this point in time? Because it's, it's starting to pick up speed. No. Why? Because the engine is not working. Exactly. The computers, the, computer, exactly. the computers are not working. Exactly. Exactly. Correct. What's the expression? Mayo Chuz. 100%. Um, so, yes. Here again. So, you know, again, my point that I made before. Technology is wonderful. But uh, 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 as you just said, you have to have the train working. The computers have to be on to in order to engage the brake. The brake has to be on. The engine has to be on to engage the brake. So, so here we have a, a basically the locomotives are all turned off, and it's just going straight straight on gravity. It's on a one percent grade, a ten mil grade. It's going down to four, 12 kilometers. At the, at the bottom of the grade, uh, you can see it was about 100 kilometers per hour. Oh, there were five locomotives as well. Uh, so as I said, the, 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 the total was 11,000 short tons, about 10,000 metric tons. And so straight to straight gravity. Um, so what happened is what happens at 12 kilometers, and by the way, there's a town here, the town is called Lac Magentic. It's uh, that's that's in French. This is this is uh, Montreal. Montreal is the French-speaking part of Canada. So it turns out there's a very sharp curve leading into this town, uh, right over here. And when the when the train hit the sharp curve at 101 kilometers per hour, which was much faster than the allowable speed on the curve, what happened? It derailed. Overspeed derailment. Okay. So again, what happened here? Um, the, the, the train driver thought that everything was fine because he had the hand brakes, he, he had the air brakes applied and he had the engine working. And so as long as the engine is working, there's air in the reservoir. And so those brakes should, should be applied. The problem is when you turn off the compressor and you're no longer re re adding, re re refreshing the air in the reservoir, the air just leaks out. And this is a railroad train, nothing's airtight. And when it re when, as, it re as, it, as it leaks out, the brakes get released. So with no air pressure on, on, on the brakes, the air brakes no longer are working. And so it's the handbrakes, which is the, and this, by the way, is the purpose of the handbrakes. That's why there are handbrakes on, on freight wagons, so that, that you can make sure that there's a brake applied. The handbrake uses the exact same brake shoe as the air brake, but it uses a mechanical force. It, had a, it actually uses a system of levers to apply a mechanical force and to lock that mechanical force on the brake, which was not applied here. Okay, so as a result, the town blew up, the train derailed. You can see, you can see the derailed cars on this curve. Massive fire, because this was petroleum, burnt out the whole downtown area, killed 47 people, by the way, in the process. 
not on the train because there's nobody on the train. This is the people who were living in the town, you know. So, so remember this. This this was like 1:32 in the morning, so everybody's sleeping in downtown Magantic. Um, and so there were 47 people killed. 30, bil 30, 30 buildings were destroyed. Um, they actually, the, the, the railroad that actually was running this was a, was a railroad called the MMNA, uh, actually went bankrupt. Um, and the insurance, the estimate, oh, uh, oh, and then there was environmental damage. Uh, there was oil spill into, uh, into a nearby river. So not only were there you know, tens of thousands of barrels of crude oil spilled in the town, but it spilled into a near, nearby river. So um, uh, the estimated cost of the cleanup was about $200 million. Um, needless to say, criminal charges were also filed against the locomotive. The railroad was sued. It was, it was a major, major disaster. Okay. Now let me switch to another accident, which, uh, which is a slightly different type of accident. And then we're gonna actually do some engineering in this process because we're gonna calculate some braking distance calculations. But again, this is, um, uh, you know, I, I started off by saying all this wonderful thing that PTC can do. Now let's talk about some of the things that PTC can't do or ETCS cannot do. Okay, so this is an accident that happened uh, in a place called Chester, Pennsylvania, which is just south of Philadelphia, uh, between Philadelphia and Wilmington, Delaware, uh, on, Am again, Amtrak Northeast Corridor. And I'm um, familiar to this one, too. I also got involved with the, at least the press called me in on this one a little bit as well when it happened. So what happened here is an Amtrak train struck a backhoe working on the track. So there was track maintenance. So let's look over here. Underneath this train is a piece of rubber tired maintenance away equipment. So what would happen is this track over here was out of service because there was maintenance being done on it. And so no trains were operating on this track. This track would occasionally be taken out of service when the equipment from this track had to go over to this track to work on it. So a backhoe, which is the vehicle that this train struck, is a rubber tired vehicle um, that basically has a, ha, has a bucket at the end, used for, does a lot of ballast work. So it was actually working on the shoulder of the ballast of this track over here. But to work on the shoulder of the ballast, it had to, it had to, it had to walk over this track. So, what happened was they were working in the morning. There was a, there was a maintenance away crew change. The, main, the afternoon maintenance away crew did not properly report in the, the, that they were going to use this track. So this track was kept open. This train was operating at normal speed. I think it was going about 200 kilometers per hour, which was normal speed. It was well within acceptable speed ranges. And the backhoe backed up on this track. So because the backhoe was rubber tired, it does not set off the track circuits, right? To set off the track circuits, you have to have an electrical connection. You have to literally short out the track circuit between the two rails. Now a normal steel rigid axle with two rail, two steel wheels and a steel axle will short out the sur track circuit and, 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 and you'll know there's a, there's a vehicle there. But in this particular case, the vehicle is rubber tired. Rubber tires do not short out the track circuit. So the fact and, and, and the and the main and the crew supervisor did not report to the dispatcher that they had they were running over the track. So here comes this train calmly at, a, you know, at about 200 kilometers per hour, 106 miles per hour. So uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty close to 200 kilometers per hour, maybe maybe 190 kilometers per hour. And it was well within authorized speed. Authorized speed was with 110 kilometers per hour. Uh, and uh, hit the backhoe, killed two people that were in the backhoe. 
the operator and a track supervisor, both were in the were backhoe. 41 people in the train were, hospital, were injured or hospitalized. And you can see the car didn't even turn over, but the force of the track was sufficient. You can see the, the backhoe, by the way, is a big piece of maintenance away equipment. The fact that it's completely underneath this locomotive, you can see the damage done to the locomotive and everything um, indicates that uh, uh, it was a huge amount of collision. The, the train driver was one of the people injured, but the two fatalities were only with the people in the backhoe. And about $2 million worth of damage. Okay. So, as I said, this track was closed. And this track should have been closed when the backhoe was operating it. But, but they didn't do that. Positive train control were in place. And, I, and, and working. But because... It was a rubber tired vehicle. It did not set off the, it, it did not indicate that there was a maintenance away vehicle on the track. So there was no positive train control reaction. And as I indicated, there was miscommunication between the, the morning shift and the afternoon shift foreman. So the dispatcher was not aware of the fact that there were, that they may be going there. Um, it was a difficult situation. Now, since then, there's been some discussions uh, in some of the positive train tech control technology to start putting GPS transmitters on every piece of maintenance away equipment so that they will always know where they are. That was not part of the positive train control system or the ETCS system and that at that time. But since then, um, the, the railroads are moving to put positive train control or put GPS trans, uh, transmitters onto each of the um, onto each of the uh, uh, maintenance away equipment to tell them what's going on. Oh, and by the way, it was a clear day. The train driver did see the backhoe on the track. He did apply everything. He applied a full service application. He applied an emergency brake application. He put the maximum brakes that he can put on, but he can't stop in time. Because in general speaking, when you're traveling at distances like 200 kilometers per hour, you can not stop in time. And so let's go to the mathematics. Let's start talking a little bit about that. Okay, so let's first of all go back and talk about break to the type of brake applications. By the way, before I leave this and do the calculations, any questions about what this accident and what, uh, what, what happened here? Really critical piece of this here because that's what we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about is the fact that the driver saw the backhoe, applied an emergency brake application, but couldn't stop the train in time. And that's, that's the nature of a railroad operations. Railroad operations, you usually can't, you, and when, you're, when you're traveling at higher speeds and higher speeds for a freight wagon can be as, you know, can be, 90 kilometers per hour or 80 kilometers per hour, uh, and you can't stop in time. So the type of braking applications, a service application is what we call a partial brake application. We use this to slow down the train. For example, when the trains are going into the curves, they should have slowed down from 100 kilometers per hour to 50 kilometers per hour in some of the examples we showed you earlier today, um, uh, what you do is you apply a combination of engine brake, which is the traction motor braking that you do, and air braking. Depend, depending on, how, on how, you're, the, how the driver's controlling this train, usually you apply a combination of uh, traction motor braking 
and air braking and slow the train down. And that's how you slow the train down from say 100 kilometers an hour to 50 miles an kilometers per hour. And that's often, and that's usually referred to as a service application or a partial application of the braking system. If you want to stop the train normally, and and you know, and you know, you're coming to a station, you want to stop the train. I don't care if you're a metro or Amtrak or uh, you know, Chakavit Yisrael. You 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 want to stop the train. That's usually referred to as a full service application. You, you're applying the brakes fully to stop the train in a controlled, gradual way. And the third mode of application is an emergency application. That's where you basically dump all your air. Um, you know, even in a full service application, you're not losing all the air in your reservoir. You're using your mostly a lot of your air in a controlled measure, measure but it'll replenish. You expect it to be replenished fairly quickly. And you, you can just stop and get in a normal controlled manner. Um, emergency, you would try, you want to use as much braking capability as you have in your system. You dump 100% of the air, which means you use the full pressure in your reservoir, plus you're using your traction motor brakings simultaneously. So in an emergency application, everything is applied all at once. So what, so what we have here is a partial service application. When you're just slowing the train down, uh, you may be slowing your train down the equivalent of one to two kilometers per hour per second. So let's say for argument's sake, you want to slow your train down from 100 kilometers per hour to 50 kilometers per hour going into a curve. Okay, so that's the, so you'll see, you want to slow it down about 50 kilometers per hour. So I need, if I apply a, a, a partial surface application of one kilometer per hour per second, it's going to take me about 50 seconds to slow down or just under a minute to slow down from 100 to 50. If I, if I, if I apply, um, you know, if I if I go up to two kilometers per hour, it'll take me about 25 seconds to slow down. If I want to stop the train, my standard brake application is of the range of two, two to three kilometers per hour per second. So if I'm going 100 kilometers per hour, and I want to come to a controlled stop. If I go, if I apply two, a, a braking rate of two kilometers per hour per second, it'll take me 50 kilometers, 50 seconds. If I apply 33 kilometers per second, per second, it'll take me 33 seconds or about a half a minute to slow down normally. If I'm in an emergency brake situation, my emergency brake rate of braking can be as high as four to five kilometers per second. So if I'm going hundred kilometers per second, 100 kilometers per hour, um, it would take me between 20 and 25 seconds to stop this to stop the train in an emergency mode. And if I was in the previous problem, the backhoe problem that I just talked about, where I'm going 200 kilometers per hour per second, it would take me between 40 and 50 seconds or so to stop the train. And the braking curve is somewhat nonlinear. By the way, uh, the braking curve is not perfect, uh, is not uniform, because first of all, the first of all, there's a there's always a reaction time de delay. The driver sees the guy, and it takes him a couple of seconds to say, or sees the backhoe, and says a couple of seconds to say, "Oops, there's a backhoe on my track." Remember. They're, 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 he knows that they're working on the next track. So it may take him even longer to figure that out because he knows that there's, there, there's maintenance away work at that location in the adjacent track. So he looks ahead and see a backhoe and he's, and he's a fair distance away. He may say, mm, oh, is, is, is the backhoe on the, backhoe is on the other track where it should be? And it may take him a few seconds to react. It may take him as much as five or seven seconds 
to react and realize that that is a problem and apply the brake. Another issue that you have with braking is the time of propagation through the train. In a freight train, particularly in a long freight train, it can take it can take a few seconds for the uh, for the air signal to go through. Why? Because the air signal goes at the speed of sound, which is what is about 600 miles per hour. So that would be what about 900 feet per second. So if the train was 3,000 feet in length, it may take four seconds for the brake signal to propagate. So it would take four seconds for the rear trains. A short passenger train is pretty, it's pretty fast, fast. A short passenger train, it may take less than a second for the air brake to propagate. But there is a, there is, there is a air propagation delay. OK, so how do we calculate brake distance and brake time? So I'm going to give you the, the most simplistic equation, um, something that you can use very simply when you want to calculate the numbers on your own. There are, very, there are much more sophisticated braking models that take into account the propagation delay and take into account the variation in distance and brake pressure going through the system, but um, also take into account different local variations in the uh, performance of each individual braking system, because in a wagon, not every braking system may be functioning at 100%. But I want to give you basically a simplistic analysis model so that you can do it. Uh, there, there is a, a, an example also on Moodle, uh, which uh, I want you to practice and, and look at between now and we have the exam. But uh, let's, uh, let, let's, for the time being, work, work here. OK. so. Let's start off by saying V is our speed. And we're going to be doing where we'll go back into the metric world. And so V is our speed in, in kilometers per hour. BR is my braking rate. So my braking rate we just talked about, uh, two to three kilometers per hour per second, four to five kilometers per hour per second. So braking rate is usually given in terms of kilometers per hour per second or, or in, in the metric world, or that can be converted to meters per second per second or meters per second squared, right? So I can have kilometers per hour per second or meters per second squared as my, as my braking rate, because it's a rate. Speed is kilometers per hour or meters per second, Braking is the rate of change of the speed. So it's the kilometers per hour per second or meters per, per, per second per second or meters squared. I also have my reaction time, T. So reaction time is just what I mentioned. The time it takes for the driver to physically realize that there's a problem and he has to apply the brake. And reaction time is never zero. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look uh, at uh, some of the standard books that talk about automobile accidents and, and what it takes to stop an automobile, there's a lot of discussion on the whole issue of reaction time. What's the reaction time of a driver? Because it's, it's not instantaneous. There's a finite reaction time. And then the other variable is braking time, the time to brake. So very, very simply, braking time is speed divided by braking rate. So it's exactly what we did back here. If I have a 200 kilometer per hour uh, train speed and my braking rate is five kilometers per second, my braking time is 40 seconds. And then my braking distance has two components. It has the reaction time component, and then the braking time component. So the reaction, so braking distance is the speed of the train times the reaction time, because if the train's going 200 kilometers per hour, and there's a five second reaction time, so it's going, 
um, it, you know, it, it's basically uh, 200 kilometers per hour times five seconds divided by 3,600 uh, seconds per hour. Um, so it's going to it's it's going to go uh, you know several hundred meters plus depending on the uh, on the speed. And the so th so this is the so so this is this is the distance due to the reaction time, and this is the distance due to the breaking. And the distance due to the breaking comes out of basic high school physics or basic college physics. So a breaking distance is the speed times the breaking time minus one half the breaking rate times the time squared. V zero T minus one half A T squared. Now you can you you can mathematically replace V by T times BR and you get BR BRT squared minus one half BRT squared makes you plus BR one half BRT squared. So there are a couple of different ways you can see this equation. I like to use this form because this is usually the form that most, most physics classes teach. So for example, if you remember the classical problem, if I drop a ball from a tall building and how, what's the speed on when it hits the sidewalk, um, then the, 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 the um, the, the normal problem is V zero, VT minus one half V BRT, one half minus GT squared, where G is the acceleration of gravity. So if you just drop the ball, for example, then V initial is zero, right? And then, and then just you calculate the distance by one half the, break, uh, the acceleration of gravity times the time squared. But if you throw it down there, then you have an initial speed. So again, this is this is an equation that you see very common. So I like to use it. So your break, my breaking distance is my reaction time distance, uh, which is v times the reaction time plus v t minus one half b r t squared, the speed times the breaking time, which I got from here, minus one half b r t squared. So let's let's apply it to the Amtrak problem. Okay. So the initial speed was 106 miles per hour. Sorry, it was 171 kilometers per hour, which you can convert to 47.4 meters per second. I'm going to I'm going to end up doing the problem in meters per second and meters per second squared because that'll give you the answer in meters. You can just as easily do the problem in kilometers, just uh, whatever you like to do. So. My initial speed is 171 kilometers per hour or 47.4 meters per second. The train driver sees the equipment of the track and I'm gonna assume a five second reaction time. By the way, if you go through reaction time studies, you'll see that most studies say reaction times are between three and seven seconds. That's the more common range of reaction times. If somebody's distracted, it can be greater than seven seconds, but almost never it's less than three. And so I picked five as sort of being at a midpoint of the three to seven second range. And that's a number that I've seen used a lot in accident reconstruction type analyses. So I'm gonna assume a breaking rate that's gonna be 1.5 meters per second squared which works out to be about three, just a little over three miles per hour per second. So if I come back over here, I'm assuming a break, I'm gonna start off with a braking rate of about three kilometers per hour per second. So standard braking, a little bit over three kilometers per second. So three, 3.3 3 miles per hour per second is 4.9, Sorry, as 5.4 kilometers per hour per second is 1.5 meters per second squared. So my breaking time is my speed, 47.4 meters per second 
divided by 1.5 meters per second squared is 31.6 seconds. I happen to have done this problem here in the English side, but you can see from here, it's uh, 30. 30 would take us to 45, right? So 31.6 is pretty close to 47.4. So my breaking distance, let me do this version of it here. I don't know why I can't see the bottom. Here we go. I can't see the bottom of my screen, but we'll work on it here. So if my I'm looking at I'm looking at three different breaking rates. I'm going to look at so let's let's go let's finish this problem here first. So um, do I have the metric? No, I don't have the metric version of it. Sorry, I, I I thought I had the metric version of this up here. So basically, my reaction time, my 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 breaking distance for the reaction time, is five seconds times my speed of forty-seven point four four meters per second. So that's just that's about 240 meters. So my breaking distance is about 240 meters. And my and my and my breaking distance. Is, so my breaking time remember is 31.6. So it's V, which is for 40, let me see if I can get a little better. So, good. So my breaking, so I get my breaking distance is 47.4 times five is the breaking distance for the reaction time or roughly 240 meters. And my breaking distance here is 47.4 times 31.6 minus 0 0.5 times my breaking rate of 1.5 meters per second squared times 31.6 squared, which comes out to be, so that was at 1.5 meters per second. Oh, why can't I see this? I can't see my own screen here. Let me see if I can do it this way. No, it's not letting me. Bear with me for one second, please. Okay, so this comes out to be about 749 meters. Please feel free to check it. You've got a problem that you can solve it, but you're going there. So the total, 
distance is just under a kilometer. in this particular problem. If I take a look, if I try to compare all three cases, so in this particular case, I've calculated three, three different braking rates. I've calculated a standard braking rate of point, uh, 0.5 meters per second squared. Back here, I've calculated an emergency braking rate of one meter per second squared and a braking rate of 1.5 meters per second squared. And in this particular case, I used a three second reaction time instead of a five second reaction time. So my reaction time distance, so my speed is still 47 meters per second squared. So my reaction time distance is about 140 meters in all three cases. In all three cases, I have a breaking, a reaction time distance of 140 meters, but I have a stopping distance that's different in all three different cases because I have a different breaking rate. So at the 1.5, meter per second squared braking rate. My braking distance is about 750 meters. And so my total braking in this particular case is about 900 meters, so just under a kilometer. At one meter per second squared, my total braking distance counting both would be about 1.26 kilometers. 1,266 meters. And my braking rate at 0.5 meters per second. In other words, if I was just gonna slow normally down into going into a station uh, and, not, and not, not being in an emergency mode would be well over two kilometers, rough, roughly 2,390 meters. And now you can see why the driver cannot, could not stop in time. Because generally speaking, most of the time you don't have uh, you know, having a kilometer of visibility uh, is not always possible, especially if you have any sort of curvature, any distance in the track. Any questions here on what I've done? Is this all clear? Yes. Okay. Good. So let's go on. Let's go on to some just some other accidents. Just to don't. Now let's get into some. Uh, we're going to get into some vehicle track dynamics. Some some uh, vehicle improper loading tracks. Remember, we showed a lot of improper loading type of problems. So this is an accident that happened on what's called the Great Belt Bridge in Denmark, which is a very long bridge. Um, uh, in northern Denmark, uh, on, on the way to, to Copenhagen. And there, there's a picture of the bridge and the actual accident. What happened here was very simple. There was a heavy storm with very high winds. And basically, there was a, tra a trailer on flat car. So it was a freight train that was carrying him other things, flat cars with a, with a trailer on it. And the wind was sufficient enough to knock, knock part of the trailer off of the flat car. There was a passenger train going on the next track, on the, on the adjacent track. The semi-trailer hit the passenger train and uh, uh, caused actually some very serious injuries. Eight people killed, 16 injured. Again. Again, notice 2019. Again, no train control system in the world will solve this problem. This is just simply something that can't be handled by a train control system. In fact, what ended up happening in this particular one was the, the pocket of that wagon. So what happens is what's the pocket of the wagon? If you remember what a trailer looks like, 
A trailer usually has rubber wheels in the back and it has basically a kingpin, which is goes into the tractor in front of it. Remember, so, so you have, you know, so that so on the high, so the highway tractor normally picks up the kingpin of the trailer and that's how and, and then picks that up and it runs on its rear rubber wheels and on the rubber wheels of the of the of the, of the tractor. Um, when you put it on a flat car, of course, you don't take the tractor, the tractor goes away. You just put the trailer. So the trailer gets the, the kingpin of the trailer gets locked into a pocket. And the pocket design varies with different types of wagon. This this was this particular wagon was a very common European type of wagon design. For designed specifically for trailers, uh, where the bottom wheels go into a pocket, and the and and the front is and the pocket can, picks up this, uh, um, and there's a separate pocket that picks up the front kingpin. So afterwards, they had to they ended up taking this particular type of wagon and changing the pocket design. <laughs> Again, this is recent. This is 2019. We're not talking about ancient history here. So again, the th this is the kind of this is the kind of accident that is really not going to do very much good anyway. You can see you can see the by the way the guardrail worked here. Somebody asked me about the guardrail. The guardrail worked over here. And they, they notice notice there was no um, uh, no no wagon went into the went into the water, but uh, you can see. There was some pretty severe damage done to that rear wagon by that uh, by that trailer hitting it. But okay, which brings us to the issue of train loading, train handling. Um, just want to quickly go through this and sort of familiarize you with this, uh, and talk a little bit about um, you know how how the, how this works. So train handling. You know, if you're on level flat ground, train handling is pretty easy. You speed up, you slow down, you slow down for a station, you speed up going out of a station, no big deal. What happens if you're going up and down a grade? Well, when you're going up and down a grade, then all this, and then you have a very long train to boot, then you have, can have a situation where your rear of your train is essentially in ten tension what we call a run out, where the wagons are basically pulling on the connectors. So if you have so so if you have a hook and buff connector, your hooks are fully, fully, fully extended in tension. But the front of your train could be in compression, which is a run in situation. So in this particular case, you're hitting on your buffers. So your front of your train, the wagons are hitting on the buffers and the rear of the train, the wagons are, are pulling on the hooks. This now requires some a little bit more sophisticated train handling. Otherwise you run the risk of pulling the train apart or having, when this goes over the, cliff, over, over the top of the hill, having an excessive run in, excessive compressive forces that can knock the curve, knock the vehicle off the track particularly if you always happen to be a curve on that grade. Remember, a lot of grades are going around a mountain. You know, think of the, think of the old Jerusalem line, the one that goes from Beit Shemesh to Jerusalem right now. That, that's basically going up a mountain. So you're going up a severe grade and you're on a curve the whole way. I showed you this earlier. Virtually 90% of the Beit Shemesh to Jerusalem line is on a curve, on a grade. So if I have this very large compressive force now coming in, you now let's look at it from a, from a plan point of view, look at it from the top of the curve, I have a large compressive force on that curve that has a lateral component. Again, gives me the potential for, for loading while well, L over V. If I now apply my dynamic brakes as well, I have an additional longitudinal force. So whenever I have a lot, I apply my dynamic brakes. I have a longitudinal force. My, my, my train is running in. So again, train handling, couple that with poor train makeup. We talked about this before. If I have a train and I put a couple of empty wagons behind the locomotive, 
And then I put maybe 30, 40 loaded wagons behind the empty wagons. I come along, I have, a, I have my run-in, I have my compressive force, I'm going down a grade, for example, around a curve, I have a high L, my wagons are empty. So what's my V? My V is low. So I have a high L over V. What's going to happen? That wheel's going to climb. And in fact, that is a very classical case of a poor train makeup type of accident. Happened, happened for, for years and years and years um, until train makeup rules came into force and pro prohibited that. And you still see them every once in a while. The connectors also, again, going around a fur curve can have very significant uh, lateral force components. Again, you can see, likewise, but by just mixing the different cars together, short, heavy cars with, uh, and having a long, light car, uh, that's a real, again, a recipe for a, for a, for a disaster. Um, I have my run-in force, plus my coupler angle is very short here which means I have a high lateral component. Again, high L, empty car, low V, high L over V force. Can also, can also have what we call lateral buckling of the train as opposed to the track. So lateral buckling of the train is when you have a, also called jackknifing. You can see this looks like a jackknife, a pocket knife. Um, so this is lateral buckling of a train as opposed to lateral buckling of the track. Uh, I'm going to skip this accident a little. This was, again, a train run-in type of accident with buckling, but it's a train handling type of accident. Here, here the high longitudinal train forces. Again, what happened here, the train was going in that direction. It actually derailed. Uh, it, 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 originally, there, there, there was a derailment over here, and the propagator rolling down the track, but we had high. There was also a grade down here, so it, it doesn't show. So there's some high lateral forces and some, again, an L over V type of derailment. Train loadings, we talked, uh, car loadings, wagon loadings, we talked about just to refresh your memory, <clears throat> eccentric loadings in the lateral direction, eccentric load is in the longitudinal direction. This, gener this excites the, the rocking type of motion, what we called rock and roll or a roll type of motion. This excites a pitch and bounce type of motion. where the front and whack, if I, if I match this also with having uh, my either joints or welds that are battered and opposite each other, then this can, this can excite a significant um, pitch, bat, pitch catch type of motion, also called pitch. There are train overload and ballast detectors which are variations of a vertical wheel load detector that measure all eight wheels on a wagon, measures the nominal load and sees if there's any imbalance either laterally or longitudinally. And again, provides that information either to the locomotive engineer or to a dispatcher or to a maintenance facility. Um, very common type of actions. Okay, uh, I've got a little bit of time left I want to talk about two last derailments, and then I'm gonna and, and then I'm gonna stop. Uh, we may end up actually breaking a little bit early today, uh, which I'm sure everybody would be happy for. Um, so let's talk about the to these last two two uh, unusual accidents. Um, both of these accidents are now signaling type of accidents. One is a railroad, one's a metro. So I haven't forgotten you metro people. We're gonna end up with a metro signaling accident. But in the meantime, I wanna end up with this uh, bridge uh, railroad type of accident. Okay, so this happens in Paulsboro, New Jersey, which is uh, not far from New York City, the other end of New Jersey actually. 
but it was a messy chem chemical train de de a reaction derailment. Okay, so there was a swing span bridge. So a swing span bridge, and that's the bridge here, you know, unfortunately it's after the accident. So a way the swing span bridge is, no, you're probably more familiar with the drawbridge which goes up and down. Well, that's not the swing span bridge. The swing span bridge, the bridge rotates in the plane. So the bridge will rotate 90 degrees and end up leaving two channels of water for a ship to go through. So this bridge in its, in, in its, in its normal, in, in, its in its train operation mode, obviously goes across the river to allow the train to go across. In its uh, navigation mode, it rotates 90 degrees and it becomes parallel to the banks of the river and it creates two channels for the ships to go through. And then there's an A-frame on the bridge. That's the structural frame that controls the, the spanning mechanism. And in this particular case, the these uh, three or four tank cars derailed, knocked down the A-frame, caused the entire bridge to collapse. Four tank cars ended up dropping into the creek uh, because they were chemical tank cars. They had vinyl chlorides in one of the cars. That, that actually formed a chloride type of gas. Uh, they had to aban aban abandon a nearby town. Um, uh, and or the town was Paulsboro. They have been several blocks of the town because you basically had a chlorine gas cloud hanging over the derailment site. Ah, here you can see it a little bit differently. Um, again, swing stand bridge, this bridge, normally would rotate 90 degrees so it would be in this direction so ships can go through in this particular case it was in the railroad position uh the frame that normally the structural member frame that supports the bridge you can see is uh, collapsed and you can see the tank cars are in the water i think i mentioned this is this was this is the only case i ever knew of where the agency in charge of the investigation was the Coast Guard, because the Coast Guard had jurisdiction over this particular waterway. And because the tank cars fouled the waterway and got into the waterway, the Coast Guard actually ended up taking overall jurisdiction for this, for this particular investigation. Okay, another view. You can see the A-frame has collapsed. See the tank cars in the water. Again, you can see the A-frame and the tank cars. Okay, so I actually got uh, I actually got some interesting information on this one because it turned out several people from that railroad were taking one of my railroad classes. When this accident happened, so I actually got to go the low, the, the 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 blow by blow, get the actual discussion. So normally, what happens? Ah. Normally, what happens after after the bridge is in the open position? Uh, when it when it when it needs to go into the railroad position, it's rotated ninety degrees, and there's a locking mechanism, as you would expect. At either end of the bridge, locking the locking the bridge in place and performing contouring of the track, and there is a signal uh, at the end of the bridge that indicates that the locking mechanism is properly engaged and and structurally sound and everything is working right. So in this particular case, the locking mechanism signal gave a red signal. So the locking mechanism had indicated there was, there, there was a problem with the, uh, uh, with the mechanism. Now, just to make life interesting, this particular bridge had a history of signal problems. So there was a history of signal problems with that locking mechanism. 
And it was a history of about five, seven years. So it was a, it was a significant history. So what, no, what happens is in this particular case, the, when the train, the train was still off the bridge, the train, the train was still back here, off the bridge. The, the, one of the crew members got off the train and walked across the bridge and physically checked what he thought was the connection between the bridge and between the bridge and the track. And he said that the bridge is properly lined, it's properly blocked, and there's just a problem with the signal. Of course, he was not on the signalman, so he couldn't check out the signal. But he 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 looked, he physically looked at the bridge and said the bridge was locked and lined. So the crew went on the radio, advised the dispatcher that the, that 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 they that the, a physical verification the bridge was lined happened, and so the train started going across the bridge. Um, and then originally the train started going over the bridge, the end of the engineer actually went over the bridge, the first cars of the train went over the bridge, and then the engineer started to see the frame of the bridge moving from side to side and then collapse. It turned out that in this particular case, the signal was correct and not the case. Now, again, I mentioned that there were multiple malfunctions. There were actually 24 malfunctions of the signal system uh, during, the, the, during the previous year. And normally the bridge is left open. The tra railroad traffic is relatively small for the bridge. So the open position for the bridge was the was a ship traffic position uh, uh, during, uh, during this time of the year. So um, uh, in this particular case, they closed the bridge. They saw the red signal. They know the history of malfunctions. They went there and um, uh, thought they verified the locking of the bridge. But it turned out they were wrong. In this particular case, the signal light was correct. The bridge locks were not properly in place. Um, the signal showed red, and uh, they went across because the crew member um, really couldn't look underneath the bridge and really look at the locking mechanism. He looked at it from the outside, and it just wasn't good enough. Uh, I mentioned there was a significant evacuation. Um, the bridge was so the bridge was subsequently subsequently replaced, and you know there was all sorts of acts, you know costs forever. And the NT this is this is actually beyond that. There was an NTSB report, and the NTSB report was that the 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 the, 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 the sig the signal was prop was functioning properly at this time, but had a history of problems, which led to the in the, the improper reading by the train crew and the ultimate accident. Okay. Um, I showed you a picture of the Millsbury, De Delaware accident. This is a classical uh, uh, one. What, what can we do about this one? Uh, this one was a, um, uh, a uh, it was a rainstorm, tree overturned, blocked the track, happened at 4 a.m., no visibility or poor, very poor visibility. Um, uh, obviously the, tra the, the, the tree made out of wood does not short the track circuit. So uh, there was a, uh, the, the, train, the, the train hit the, uh, the tree and derailed. Okay, last one that I wanna talk about. And this is a Metro one. So this actually happens to deal with Washington Metro. And this was actually a signal failure. Now, if you remember from some, from the, from two weeks ago, I indicated that signal failures are rare because the signal generally works well, but they do happen. And so signal failures, and, and this is one of the reasons why even positive train control systems are designed as back safety backup systems because signal systems can fail. Okay, so this is a older problem, but 
Washington Metro had basically train control systems from day one, like many metros. Most metros have some sort of ATC or ATS automatic train stop or automatic train control system that uh, if you go past a red signal, um, the train will stop automatically. We'll, we'll, we'll tell the driver to stop and if he doesn't drop, stop, he stops the train. Uh, actually, if you go past the signal, we'll just tell you to stop. It'll just stop the train immediately past the signal. It doesn't wait at that point in time. So in this particular case, a trailing metro train hit a, the rear of a, stop, of a stop train. So there were two trains and two different signal blocks. This front train was stopped and this rear train was, you know, had, had this nothing on the, nothing in the train control system stopped them. The dispatch, dispatcher didn't stop them and he hit the rear of the train. Why? We'll, uh, we'll get to that. Um, because I, I, get, I obviously signal failure, but how and what happened? So the lead car of the trailing train hit the rear car of the first train, uh, caused it to survive, uh, it, caused, it caused it to, 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 to collapse. The force was such that the, uh, um, the lead car lost some, um, uh, almost 60 feet of the trailing car, sorry, 60 feet of the lead car was telescoped, um, and about and and uh, at this result, nine people were killed, fifty-two people hospitalized, about twelve million dollars worth of damage on the on the two trains. It was a really messy, nasty problem with Washington Metro. You can see this was the front train. This was the rear train. You can see it hit the rear train. You can see how this one was popped in the air. This one telescoped was crushed basically. Okay, so the automatic trains control system lost, the automatic train control system lost the front stop train. The signal system stopped the de detecting the presence of that train. So the dispatcher and the train control system thought that train was had moved past the block, was, was in the next block over. And basically the train control system allowed the rear train to move forward. Again, there was an automatic train control system present, but the system lost, literally lost the front train. Now, why did it lose to lose the track train? Because the, apparently there was a failed track circuit module and that failed cir track circuit mod mod module was creating a false, spur spurious means false signal that looked like a legitimate track circuit signal that said the track was all clear. So there was a, so there was a failure in the track circuit mo module that created a signal that basically looked like an all clear signal. And that basically told the automatic train control system that there was nothing in that block. That train that was stopped there was physically not there and it allowed the train behind to keep going. Now, just to make life more interesting, apparently the manufacturer of the circuit system, of the train circuit system, realized that there was a problem and developed an improved track circuit verification test to, 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 to see whether all the track circuit modules were working properly. Apparently there was a collision that happened a few years before that, a near collision, sorry, that happened a few years before where there was, a, there was concern about the validity of the track circuits. So they developed this test and gave it to Washington Metro and Washington Metro did not develop a comprehensive plan to test every circuit on the railroad or on the Metro with that verification procedure. So they only spot checked certain circuits that they thought were, were, were used. 
if they would have done a complete system verification, they would have th that would have detected the failed track circuit module, and it would determine that the track circuit was not working, was not detecting train, and could have prevented the ac accident. So here again, we're looking at a two-part failure. We're looking at a, a mechanical failure, in this case, an electrical failure of the track circuit module that created the spurious signal. And we're looking at a management failure where they had a procedure that was developed because there was a problem a couple of years before, but they failed to implement that procedure everywhere. They used it only for, for track circuits that they thought were not functioning. There was nobody, they had, nobody had anybody any thought to believe that the track circuit that actually failed here was, was failed. And so they, they did not employ it. So their causes were, again, failure of the track circuit module to, 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 uh, to detect the train. It lost the detecting train. And so it gave permission for the train behind it to speed up and go past, you know, it actually gave it a green signal. So there was no red signal that went past. It just went through a green signal. And then there was WMATA's failure to uh, use that enhanced trans track circuit verification process. Now, what I find interesting here, contributing to the accident were Washington, WMATA's lack of a safety culture. This unfortunate, now, we talked about safety culture uh, very early, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Safety culture is an intangible. It's a, it's a concept, but it's a rare, very important concept. Um, in the United States railroad industry, there is a, there's a safety award given to the, most, to the safest railroads every year called the Harriman Award. And there's a gold, silver, and bronze for first, second, and third. And over the last 20 odd years, the Norfolk Southern Railroad has won that award about 90, 85% of the time, 85 to 90% of the time. And that railroad is credited with having one of the best safety cultures in the industry. What is a safety culture? A safety culture is not only where, every, is, is where everybody from the management down to the, to, to the lowest worker is concerned about safety and is willing to report safety. Um, an example of a safety culture I gave you last week when I talked about uh, PATCO, the, the metro in South Jersey to Philadelphia, where they had a wheel climb derailment in the yard uh, near, near, near one of the track washers. It was a low speed derailment, no damage. The wheel was on the ground. Uh, and in a very low speed and unhazardous environment. Just the same, the general manager, the chief engineer, the chief mechanical officer, and the chief operations officer all went out. They actually called me. I was, I know all this because they called me to determine the cause of that accident. And I had every one of the senior managers of that metro physically out on the ground when we did our safety investigation. We found there was a wheel climb derailment that was, uh, that was a worn flange type of derailment, which we talked about last time within the dial equations. So we had a excessively worn flange that caused the wheel to climb. And we reported that and they immediately took action. That's safety culture. WMATA was, was, was a, unfortunately a poster child for poor safety culture. WMATA has had a history of poor safety culture. And uh, does it make a difference? Um, all, all, all the accident statistics say yes. A safety culture where management is devoted to safety, but not only management, but the workers themselves are devoted to safety, are willing to report the issues of concern. And management is willing to listen. So, so you have a two-part issue. You have the workers say, hey, I think we got a possible problem. And the managers say, hey, let me listen, look into this. And this, this type of safety culture has been found to be very, very important in affecting the overall safety of a railway system. Okay. So also contributed to the system, WMATA's failure to effectively maintain and monitor the performance. Again, management which actually comes back over here and over here. Lack of oversight, 
lack of management. This is what the what the British like to call management issues, where that where 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 the overseers are not doing that. In this particular case, Wamada had a system for testing every one of the track circuits, but they didn't have a plan to regularly check every one of the tax systems to see if there was a problem. And so in this particular case, there was a failure of a track circuit module. Nobody was testing it with this new enhanced system. And so a, a major accident with people kid died having it. And in fact, there was also a question of the manufacturer of the signaling system didn't provide a plan to detect spurious systems. So they also didn't come back to WMATA and say, hey, you should use my circuit verification system every year or every two years across the entire system. So not only did WMATA not put such a plan in place, there was not even a recommendation by the signaling people to them that they should have a system in place. And again, that ties in with the safety culture issue. Okay, I finished a little bit early. Um, let me let me open this for for questions right now. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I, oh, I want to show one more video. Hold it before I do that. You like videos? Um, let me see if I if I can show one other interesting video here. Oh, no, I don't want to do this. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, now, these I'm going to show tomorrow. Okay, no, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to save uh, uh, the, 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 the turnout videos for next week when we talk about turnouts and the grade two housing safety videos when we talk about that. Um, this is a turnout video. No, okay, I already showed you the videos I wanted to show you, sorry. Um, Now I'm going to use these next week too. Okay, uh, let's stop here and I'm opening it up for questions. Um, anybody have any questions about what we've talked about either this week or the last couple of weeks about accidents? All right, everybody's looking 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 forward to getting to getting finished 15 minutes early, huh? Last chance for questions. Okay. So let me give you the plan. Um, oh, somebody says they have bad reception. Uh, we will, as usual, upload the uh, the the. the um, we will upload the uh, uh, the recorded video to uh, Moodle uh, either today or tomorrow uh, when 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 I get it when I get it to uh, to your people over there. Okay, next week. We're going to talk about, we're going to go back to, to some track related issues, safety issues. We're going to talk about level course crossings and we're going to talk about switches. Um, the level crossings you're going to find interesting. Uh, I always consider level crossings to be a big issue in Israel uh, because I, 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 it seems to me that on a percentage basis, I seem to hear more level crossing type accents. In fact, I was on a train once from Haifa to Tel Aviv where the train was stopped for two hours because of a, at least an hour and a half for a level crossing accident uh, as well. And then we'll talk about turnouts and turnout accidents and turnout maintenance a little bit. Um, and then the following week, there'll be an exam. I strongly recommend that you go through all of the problems I put on Moodle. Uh, you know by now that I like to you know, I, I, I like to have some problems on the exam, so that's going to be there. Uh, and that will be, uh, so we have one more, one more class, one exam, and that'll be the last, for the, the, the last for this class. Unfortunately, I was not able to get to Israel uh, for this trip, even though they, op they opened up the country 
it was after my schedule and I had other things committed for the rest of the trip. So um, it looks like I'm not going to get to Israel until possibly June. So I'll have to get the, the, the date of your graduation, see if I can maybe make that one, uh, depending on timing. Uh, last opportunity for questions. Okay, then let's 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 break 15 minutes early. I got a quarter two, so I'm sure nobody, unless somebody objects very very significantly to me breaking 15 minutes early, uh, we'll stop now. Okay, everybody have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.